if your car is not running in a very hot day, especially in the 80s, even if you just have the windows cracked, it will still get hot enough for the child to be in danger in the car. Um, children's body temperatures rise about three to five times faster than adults. So typically if we are really hot, our child is really hot. You're listening to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast, where you'll gain the knowledge and confidence you need to erase the unknowns of pregnancy and birth and rock the newborn days like a boss. My name is Liesl Team. I'm a fellow mom, labor and delivery nurse, and your host. Each week on this podcast, you'll hear a mix of birth stories, expert interviews, and other fun pregnancy and birth-related content. As a reminder, anything you hear on this podcast is not medical advice. Please see mommylabornurse.com slash disclaimer for more details. And now let's get into this week's episode. Hey guys, happy Monday. So this week we are talking all about car seat safety and I had Bridget come on the podcast. Bridget is a nationally certified child passenger safety technician and she talked to us all about car seat safety. She talked to us um, about choosing a car seat tips on prepping, you know, before you even have baby, what you can do, some safety tips. She talked about what a tech even does, what a child passenger safety technician will do in the hospital for you, what they would do, you know, if you had, if you saw them in a private setting and um, different like state regulations for that. We also touched on sleeping in a car seat, sleeping in the car seat, because I think that is one, I know I'm definitely guilty of that for letting my kiddo sleep um, a little bit more than the recommended time. So she touched on those safety regulations and like why that's important and what to kind of know about that. And then we talked about forward facing and rear facing, because I know that's like an ever evolving debate of like, when do you, you know, when are you actually supposed to, you know, flip them forward facing? And then we finally talked about some resources, some free resources, and some seasonal safety. So we're kind of at the end of the summer now, um, but it's still pretty hot where I am in North Carolina. So all of the summer safety definitely still applies, but she talked about some winter safety tips to keep in mind as we get into the colder months. If you are pregnant and you have not had your baby yet, um, this is definitely a good episode to tune into and listen all about car seat safety because something that's super important, as we all know, we all want the best for our kiddos. So I'm sure you guys, you know, will learn a lot. If you've already had your baby and you already have a car seat picked out, um, that's okay too. This is definitely still a really, really good one to tune into because she definitely goes over a lot of stuff that I know I didn't realize when I was a first time mom. So I think there's a lot of really good teaching moments in this episode. So without further ado, let's get into Bridget's car seat safety episode. When you were trying to get pregnant, did you think ovulation day was your best chance each cycle? It's not. In fact, the best time to have sex is during the several days before you ovulate. You want to have sperm ready and waiting by the time the egg drops. So how can you make use of that full fertile window when you don't even know you're in it? This is where the AVA bracelet comes in. It's a sensor bracelet that detects subtle changes in your vital signs that correspond with the opening and closing of the fertile window. All you have to do is wear Ava while you sleep and sync to the app in the morning to see your five most fertile days as they're happening. Ava is better than LH tests, which only tell you the last day or two of your fertile window. It doesn't require taking your temperature or trying to decipher your cervical mucus. And it's more accurate than period tracker apps, which only guesstimate your fertility based on genetic averages. Plus, Ava's technology has been clinically tested and cleared by the FDA. So if you're trying to get pregnant, remember you've got more than just ovulation day to play with. Let Ava tell you your best five days to conceive. And right now it's $20 off for mommy labor nurse listeners. Just use the code mommy, M-O-M-M-Y at avawomen.com. And now let's get into this week's episode. Hi, Bridget. Welcome to the mommy labor nurse podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. 
Yeah, I'm super excited. So we're going to talk about car seat safety and car seat tips today. Um, This is definitely a hot topic and a popular subject and super, super important for new parents. So I'm happy to have you. Can you start by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself, your family, where you're from, all what you do, all that good stuff? Yeah, for sure. So uh, my name is Bridget Watson. I live in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, I am in the children's hospital here at my local hospital. I do injury prevention work um, and I'm a certified child passenger safety technician plus instructor. So I teach the national curriculum um, here in our state and I do a lot of stuff around injury prevention, you name it, not just car seats, um, any preventable injury. Um, And I'm married and I have a just turned two-year-old son. (laughs) So that's fun. (laughs) Nice. Nice. Yeah. I remember that age with Walter. It's, it's fun, but challenging. (laughs) Oh yeah. Yes, for sure. And he just started school. So that's a whole nother challenge. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Oh yeah. So much fun though. All right. Well today, like I said, in the beginning, we're going to be talking about car seat safety and just other tips. So I wanted to start off. We have a lot of listeners who are still pregnant or maybe they just had babies. So the question comes up of like, you know, you're starting your baby registry and you're starting to think about like, what car seat do I get? So do you have any tips on like picking a good car seat? Are there certain brands to stay away from? Are there, is there a certain like best car seat? Yeah, that's a great question. And probably the most uh, popular question I get asked here. And, you know, just out of clarity to begin with, I'm going to you know, I don't recommend anything specific and that's just out of my own preference as a tech. Um, but I will say, I think there's so much information out there and it's so overwhelming for parents, especially first time parents to pick out a seat because your instinct as a parent is to go to what is the safest, like what's the best of anything. Um, And what's interesting in the car seat world is that every car seat on the market here in the U.S. has to pass the same safety standards. So if it is being sold on the shelves, it has passed the requirements for it to be safe. And so I tell parents what's really important is you want to pick a car seat that works for multiple categories. So you want a seat that is going to fit in your car because not Mm -hmm. every car seat is compatible for every car. Um, You want a car seat that fits your budget. Um, That is super important to take into consideration. Um, You want a car seat that fits your family dynamics. So if you have multiple children, you need to take that in consideration. Um, And then what car seat you feel like you can install the right way every time, which is what we're here to help for. Um, But there's no best car seat, if that makes sense. Um, NHTSA is not allowed to um, put safety ratings on car seats. That's why you don't see that when you're Mm -hmm. in the in the store, you might see five-star NHTSA rating for easeability of use, Um, but they're not really going to put out there, like this is the safest seat um, because they all have to pass the same safety standards. I will say, I think this helps a lot of families um, when I'm working with them in the hospital. For us in our specific hospital, we have trauma seats that we lend out if a family comes in from an accident and their car seat can't be used again. The seat we use in that scenario is called the Costco Cenerinex. And that Mm -hmm. seat is a convertible and it is roughly 40 to fifty dollars full price at a yeah, store. Yeah, you can get them like at Walmart. I've yes. seen them at Walmart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, that has one of the most documented saves in our area, and it is a you know, what we call an institutional seat. There's no fuss. It's not yeah. glamorous. It is simple, but it is effective. So um, I point that out to families. That seat, I would not blink an eye to put a child in from five to 40 pounds. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's your lower end, if you will, on the price range. So Mm -hmm. I think that's a good talking point is that this seat is safe. So it's really what works best for, for the family. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, gosh, there is such a big range of price, like prices. I mean, you can get a car, like with my first with my first one, I got the travel, I think, uh, baby trend. I got the baby trend travel system. I got like the jogger and it came with a car seat and like a base. And then I had Mm -hmm. to buy an extra base with it. Um, 
And it was, you know, just the infant one. And like all of that was very, it was like 150, 160 bucks for like all of that stuff. And then my second one, I, you know, I got like one of the Duna ones Mm -hmm. and that one is like $500. It's like, (laughs) but it's like the, I mean, the Duna is obviously different because it, it, it's a little bit different, you know, because it has the wheels on it. But it's just crazy that there is yeah. such a difference in oh, price yeah. and you really and don't have to spend 300 or 400 or $500 no, to like <laughs> get just a normal, you know, infant car seat. Yeah. So. And I think when you're talking about the infant seats too, it's not going to be a, a seat that's going to last you a long time. They usually grow out of that right. within a year. So right. I think that's important, but yeah, they're anywhere from 40 to $500. And I think what I see that I hate to see the most is when a family comes that has trouble putting their car seat in and specifically, it's usually more with the convertibles. Um, and it comes to find out that the seat is just not compatible Uh, for their car. And then you don't have the chance to return it. And then yeah, they're stuck with the seat that they have just spent three, $400 on, and then they have to go buy another. So, yeah, and you're like, well, I'm not going to buy a new car. I mean, yeah. buying a new car is a lot more expensive. <laughs> a lot more, yeah. So I just, <laughs> that's the biggest thing. I don't ever want to give anybody like a specific brand because I work with all yeah. of the brands and I haven't honestly come across seats that I don't like. It's more, mm-hmm. I've come across seats that are harder to install that take more work to get them in. Um, so, you know, (laughs) is there somewhere that you can, maybe does it say on the manufacturer, what cars they're convert they're compatible with, or is that going back to the car manufacturer? Like, how do you even figure that out? Or is it just like reading Amazon reviews? (laughs) Right. No, I wish. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I think you'll talk to a lot of techs in the world and, you know, I think, you know, car manufacturers and car seat manufacturers don't talk. They don't. Lot. Why don't yeah. they talk? Like, isn't that weird? You would think yes. that they would. There must be oh, some beef. Yeah. Like they must have oh. some beef with each other. Yeah. It's so <laughs> weird, especially when it comes to like something that we saw, you know, about a couple of years ago. I don't see it as much. I don't know. I need to look more into it if word has changed, but we had a a period of time when inflatable seat belts were a thing with some seats and that caused yeah. a lot of issues within the car seat world. And, um, so it was like, oh man, like how, how do we get this message out to the manufacturers that, Hey, like, while this is safe for adults, you didn't do much <laughs> thought into the car yeah. seat. Cause you know, at the time it was very limited on what car seats were compatible with inflatable seat belts. And again, that was a real hard conversation to have with families. Um, but I would recommend looking at your car manual always, mm-hmm. because it's going to tell you which location in your car even allows a car seat to be installed. Ah, um, okay. that's another thing when we're talking about like placement, a lot of people go straight for the middle, but not every car allows a middle seat install. So if that's something that's super important to you, it's good to know that ahead of time. Um, but it's really trial and error and a lot of places will allow you to do this. I can't promise that everywhere will, but you can ask if you can take their, um, sample seat in the store and try it in their car. I know Bye Bye Baby for a while allowed families to do that here in my area. And I'm sure a lot of the smaller stores will allow it. If you have the ability to get your hands on the one that you like, um, asking if you can just make sure it fits in your car is a good way to go for sure. Yeah, that's, that's a good tip. And I I'm sure you could just take a tape measure and like measure, you know, in your car and like, then like see what the dimensions are and stuff. I know I follow the car mom on Instagram and I love her videos. And one thing that she says when you're buying a car is to like, make sure you bring those car seats. If you have two, if you have three, like bring them. And I'm like, that's such a good tip. Yes, for sure. Because the car dealer, you know, he's not thinking about, no, he's he's just trying to sell you a car. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But no, it's true. Especially with the three in the back, because that is what's really hard. Um, but there's plenty of great seats that do allow three in the back, but I would, yeah, definitely look at your manufacturers, look at the dimensions and then take into consideration if your child is going to be rear facing 
and they're going to need that additional recline because mm-hmm. a seat that would fit in your car perfectly forward facing, you might have trouble rear facing with the recline. So I know it's people always laugh about how long it takes to become a tech as far as like the certification being yeah. four and a half days. Yeah. Um, but then when you're in that certification class, you are like, oh my gosh, like how do parents, how do we expect families to know all of this all of about car seats. Yeah. And that's the reason, you know, CPSTs are even around, but it, it'll blow your mind how much there is to know that oh, you sure. as a mom are not going to find out without looking everywhere or mm-hmm. using the resources of a tech near you. Yeah, no, I love it. Um, well, let's go into, that's a good segue into like a next question about what does a, tech even do versus like in the hospital? Like what do they do in the hospital? What's their expectations there? What do they do in private practice? What maybe you can expect if you hire one or you go and see one, like what does an appointment look like? Yeah. Um, so it's a little bit different. So, um, as a nationally certified child passenger safety tech, we all have to follow the same standards, guidelines, and ethics. So no matter where you are, where you're using a tech, if it's a tech that happens to also be a nurse or someone else in the hospital, um, when you're delivering, if it is a local fire station, police officer station, um, EMS, or if it's someone that's a private tech who maybe opened their own business or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, we are all bound by the same, you know, rules. We all took the same certification. And so, um, our job truly as child passenger safety techs are to be educators. That is really what you want out of a tech is for them to educate you on your seat, how to use it, and for you to be the one that has your hands on it. Um, Mm -hmm. There are some situations where you might um, go to a tech and they install it for you and send you on your way. Um, But at the end of the day, that would not technically be best case scenario they really should be what we tell our techs when we're doing the class is in a perfect appointment. You, it should be almost like you have one hand tied behind your back and the parent has a hand tied behind their back and you both are working to get the car seat in. So um, it might take, it depends on how experienced your tech is. Some appointments might be about 20 minutes. Um, some might be 45 minutes. It depends on how in depth you would like to go with them. Um, if you have difficulty installing in your car, the make and model of your car, the year of your car makes a difference. Um, if you drive a truck, like a pickup truck, that's a different yeah. story because those are beasts in their own as far as having their own um, regulations for car seats. Um, But typically that's what we want out of Texas to be educational. We really don't want to try to tell a parent what seat they should get or shouldn't get. We just want to make sure that it's safe for their situation. Um, And there is a rule of thumb in the tech community when it comes to educating parents, it's called good, better, best, and that there's always going to be a good option, a better option, or a best option. And Mm -hmm. any three of those work. Mm -hmm. Um, At the end of the day, it's up to the parent. So we just have to educate on what we recommend and, they get to pick what choices that they want with their child passenger safety um, tech. Um, Some techs out there, I know we don't have many in our area, so I can't speak to it as much. They do maybe charge a fee, offer different classes, but there are definitely tons and tons of free resources. I know in our state of South Carolina, I don't know anybody that charges for the service, even if it's private. Um, And for us, especially in our area, we work with our local safe kids coalition and we have tons of fire departments and it's all a free service because we want families to have access to this and we don't want um, a fee to get in the way of that. So it's just different. depends on where you live, but at the end of the day, it really should be more about education. And the biggest thing is when you drive away from that appointment, you need to be the last person that touched that car seat because you need to know how to put it in mm-hmm. so that if you go to a 
a car wash or something like that, and they accidentally take your seat out, you need to be able to know how to put it back in instead of having to come back um, to attack again. Yeah. I love it. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Super hands-on. And I know that's one thing this goes into our next question about Mm -hmm. like stuff that you can do to prep, you know, Mm -hmm. before you even have your baby. One of the things that I did that I thought was so helpful, not with my first, because I'd didn't know anything with my first, but with my second, I had a different car seat, like I said. Um, and I practiced, I saw this tip somewhere. I practiced with like a little, um, it was like a little Elmo doll. (laughs) So I put Elmo in and I practiced, you know, like putting the base in and I practiced with all of the, um, the straps and tightening and loosening and all of that good stuff. So that's a tip that I always tell parents to do, um, is to practice, you know, it's, it's, great. If you have a little, you know, your neighbor Mm -hmm. just has a a, had a newborn baby or like someone, you know, but I had a baby during, you know, now I feel like it's still kind of (laughs) the peak of COVID, but I had a baby, you know, during like COVID. So no one, so a a newborn baby was not available to me really. So I had to use a doll. Um, but that's a tip that I always tell moms or tell parents to do both parents Oh, for sure is to practice. So do you have any other tips maybe like that, um, for prepping maybe before you even have baby. Yeah, for sure. And I always say, I don't think it discriminates against if it's your first or your fifth child. I think this is important um, with every child because, um, while it's great to have resources in your family. So a great example, and I'm really going to rail on my brother and I apologize if he listens to this, (laughs) but he had a child before me. And so And this of course is after I was a tech, but I was just curious of like what tips he had um, as a parent. And I checked his seat. Oh, I wasn't meaning to check a seat. I just went over to see him and I took a look at a seat and immediately I saw that he had it installed wrong. He had it, um, he had it routed through the forward facing route instead of Uh, rear facing. mm -hmm. Um, and immediately I saw it, but you know, and I told him, I was like, Oh my gosh, we have to fix this. And I showed him how easy it would have been for it to go wrong. It really only took me to take my hand and press on it. And the seat completely flipped the wrong yeah. way. Um, and he was like, Oh my gosh. And I was like, yeah. yeah, but I told him, this is a great example. If I would have not known better, I would have taken all of his advice. And then anything that might have been wrong, I would have put that into practice with my own child. So it's always great to get information from your friends, but it's still great to go to a professional because, you know, three out of four car seats in the U S are used incorrectly. So it's very likely everybody has something and that's totally fine, but, um, it's likely that you could easily get misinformation. So what I tell everybody is if you know that you're delivering, if you're delivering at a hospital, um, if you know that your, um, hospital has any kind of preparing for baby classes or, you know, hands-on classes. If they have a car seat, one highly recommend going to, especially if it's being taught by someone who's certified. Um, what you said is great. Practicing with a baby doll is awesome. And no matter what manufacturer you do end up getting, they're going to have videos on their manufacturing website on how to install and how to harness. So I definitely recommend always looking at videos of your specific seat because every seat is different. Um, But again, just reaching out to a local tech and having that checked prior to baby is what we recommend. It's just so stressful to have to worry about that in the hospital. And then your hospital might not have um, techs on shift or even in their hospital. So, um, practicing them with a baby is huge, especially harnessing. Cause I think that's always the most stressful for a new parent is actually putting the baby in the seat. It's scary. It's yeah. scary. Cause you think you know, like they're so fragile, but then I remind, I even remind parents this when they're like, you know, holding their mm-hmm. babies very gently. And I'm like, yeah, think about like what they just came out of like yes. super cramped space. They're like coming out of like bones, you oh, know, yeah. and like they're, 
they're, like babies. Yeah. You don't want to drop they're them, so right? Resilient. but yeah. they're so resilient. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Like they will be fine strapped very safely, very secure. In yeah. Car seat, so. Oh yeah. And like I said, I do this for a living. And even on our travel from the hospital home, I think we might've went 15 miles an hour. You know, yeah. we were just like barely <laughs> yeah. driving because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's different when it's yours. And that's what I told my husband. He was like, you Always do this is. all the time. And I'm like, but I haven't done this for hours yeah. yet. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, no, I think any practice is helpful for sure. Yeah. Always is. Well, let's talk about sleeping in Mm -hmm. the car seat and some sleeping myths and facts, because I see that I've seen that subject come up lately of there's like this two hour Mm -hmm. timeframe where it's like, is it, and if that's even true, that it's like safest, if you don't let your baby sleep past two hours in the car seat, or like, is it even safe at all for them to sleep in the car seat? Or can you just kind of talk about that briefly? For sure. And I know that, you know, anytime you talk about safe sleep, it can be a very sensitive topic. Yeah. Um, yeah. But when it comes to the car seat, um, we do recommend that there is a break every two hours. So yeah. it's important if you're going on long trips or anything like that to give them a break. And the recommendation is that you were right. It's around two hours. And the good thing is, especially with our little ones, it typically lines up to when they need to be fed or changed or anything like that. So we usually recommend to like pull over, give them a break. Obviously we don't want the baby fed and we've, we've, (laughs) that's a hard topic to talk about too, but you know, yeah. Feeding them in the car seat is a different, um, topic all by itself on the safety of that, but we do want to give them a break. And then we just want families to remember that, the recline of the base that your infant carrier or your convertible gives that is there. And it's super important because it is going to recline the seat in a level that helps them keep their airway open. It's going to help keep their neck back. It's not going to allow their head to for, you know, go forward. Mm -hmm. What we see sometimes when children are in their car seats too long is they kind of slide down, they get a little relaxed and maybe are not in the best position anymore. Um, so that's kind of the thought around that. We want to give them a break and we want to make sure they don't slump over in their seat. If they are in the base, um, for an infant carrier, or if they're in the car, then they're a bit safer sleeping on the road because that recline is there. But when you come to the stop or your location, we want to make sure that we never leave them in their carriers to sleep. So once you remove them from the car, take them into your house or wherever you are, if they are still asleep, you want to remove them from the carrier and put them in a safe location um, because you lose that recline once you take them out of the car. Um, but as, if they're in the car driving, obviously my son falls asleep in his car seat. I feel like as All soon as we hit the yeah. road, um, but even, you know, now that he's two, he's got his full head and neck control, obviously. Um, but I still don't keep him in his car seat typically longer than two hours without giving him a break. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And it's, it's tough because I mean, I'm guilty of it, of like yes. with my first one of bringing them in and you're mm-hmm. like, oh, they just fell asleep. I'm yes. just going to like leave them, you know, like to yes. let them sleep. But you're right. It really it makes sense that the angle is not safe. You know, it's I'll not. Yeah. Right. Like for their airway, it's really safer when they're in that base. Yeah. So. And we've had some documented injuries to that. Yeah, and that's why I'm there's, sure. there's, um, that whole talk around it. And it's important to have with your caregivers. That's what I mm. always tell parents too. You might not Good do point. that, but whoever is watching your child needs to know these tips. And especially if they're going to school or daycares, um, I had to have that tough conversation with my daycare because, um, while I absolutely love my school, I saw it happen twice where I dropped him off and, um, I can't remember what happened, but I ended up not going out the door immediately. I think I might've stopped and talked to a teacher and come back. And I saw that he was still in his carrier, like Mm -hmm. 10 minutes later. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's important to have those conversations with daycares. And, um, what I did for my own peace of mind is that I stopped dropping him off in the car seat. I physically took him out of the car seat and handed him to his teachers, nothing against his teachers, but you know, they're, they've got a lot going on. Um, but it's important. I think these conversations to have with anybody outside of who would normally keep him just for your own peace of mind too. Yeah. And that goes for 
uh, you know, conversations mm-hmm. around like how to, this is how you strap them in. Yes. This is how you take them out. This mm-hmm. is, you know, loose. This is not, lo- you know, all of the, all of those talks are very, very important. So mm-hmm. that's a, that's a good tip. Yeah. Um, let's talk about forward facing versus rear facing. Mm-hmm. Cause that's also a hot topic of like, you know, when you switch them around, <laughs> right. Yeah. That's always like, I feel like that's what people are always the, their legs are getting, yes. you know, their legs are bent. It's time for them to get switched around. And I know they've changed things recently. Yeah. So can you just talk about that for a few minutes of like yeah. when that's appropriate and when it's not appropriate? For sure. Um, it's, it's super important. And what's conflicting, um, especially when we're talking online or if you're looking online, you might follow different texts who might be based in different states. It's important to know that every state law is different. So where you live might have rear facing until one, where I live, it's rear okay. facing until two. The laws are different. But what I say is that typically when we're talking about laws in general, typically the law is going to be the bare minimum, right? So it's not always best practice and it doesn't always match up to best practice. And so thankfully for us in car seat advocacy world, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics recently changed their stance on rear facing and they now um, match up with those in the car seat world. So they've taken, um, you know, their advice from NHTSA, who's the governing body of a lot of transportation safety and safe kids and things like that. And so now um, AAP recommendation is rear facing as long as possible. So with that, it means keeping your child rear facing until they max out the height or weight of their seat. So that looks different on every Mm -hmm. seat. And that's why it's confusing. You know, I could max out my son's infant carrier at one, but then move him to a convertible that has a rear facing height or weight limit that could take him almost up to three or four. Mm -hmm. It truly depends on the child. Um, So the thought process by it is that rear facing is just a little, you know, it's more safe. It has more of the egg cradle effect. It's going to really absorb a lot of that shock from a crash that we just unfortunately don't get once we turn the child forward facing. So that's kind of why they changed that recommendation. Um, The most important thing is that you follow your manufacturer's guidelines. You never want to keep them rear facing after they've outgrown it Mm -hmm. because that immediately is not safe. Um, But manufacturers are catching up with this recommendation now. And so there are tons of convertibles on the market that have a high rear facing weight now. Um, but again, it's weight and height. Um, a lot Mm -hmm. of times we get focused on weight a lot, but height is just as important. And I know we always talk the most about our young ones, but, um, trends that we're seeing here all over the U S our children are being moved out of their five point harness too soon. Mm -hmm. So it is really important all the way up to boosters and you want to take height and weight into consideration because Because, um, you know, something that's interesting is if you look at booster weights, a lot of them will start at 30 pounds, 30 to 110 pounds, but that's because height is the factor there. And so you might have a really tall, slender child. You could have a shorter child that weighs a little bit more. So, um, even when we move out of that convertible state, height and weight. I can't stress that enough, but, um, the rule of thumb is just, you want to max out each seat. So you want to max out the height and weight of your infant carrier. Then you want to max out the height and weight of your convertible. You want to max out the height, weight, and harness of your combination. And then the same with your booster. Um, so rear facing kind of falls into that as if you have a high weight, um, and high height, rear facing car seat, you want to use it until it's maxed out. Um, and as far as the myth that, uh, their legs are in the way that yeah. again is the biggest thing that I hear too. Um, it is very, very rare that we see leg or lower limb injuries in crashes with children who are rear facing, um, crash dynamics. That could be a whole nother <laughs> 
podcasts, but oh yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but as yeah. far as that goes, we rarely see those. Um, kids um, are typically not inconvenienced by it until they've tasted freedom of being forward facing. So usually, yep. I get the the children that we get in that maybe were turned too soon, and we end up turning them back. Yeah, they're gonna have to readjust to it. But if your child has never known anything outside of rear facing, I usually tell myself, and this is me as a parent talking, am I making this change because it's inconveniencing my child or am I making this change because it's inconveniencing me? Mm -hmm. And when it comes to car seats, my inconvenience doesn't matter. I want to make sure I keep him as safe as possible. So that's what I tell myself because obviously my son is in the 99th percentile of height and weight. He's a big, yeah, yeah, (laughs) Yeah. yeah. he's a big boy. He's like 35 pounds. Yeah. Um, and so my car seat goes up to 50 rear facing and it has a pretty high um, weight. But when I look at him now, you know, his legs are like way up. And so yeah. I've taught him how to sit crisscross. Mm-hmm. Uh, he doesn't mind it. I hear him pitter pattering back there all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I always tell families the risk that we take when we turn them forward facing. And it's something that is inevitable. We're going to have to turn them forward yeah. facing at some point, but you run a higher risk of that head, neck and spine injury once we're forward facing. So I would rather have a minor lower limb injury if that is even going to happen versus having to risk a major injury um, to that head, neck, and spine. So it's again, at the end of the day, the parent's choice, but AAP um, recommends rear facing as long as possible. Yeah. I love it. That's exactly what happened with, um, I think I talked to, talked about it on the podcast a mm-hmm. long time ago, but my son, that's exactly how we went from forward facing or rear facing to forward facing mm-hmm. is he was rear facing for, you know, till he was three over three. I don't yeah. even, I don't even, it was a while and he was like just about to hit, you know, but it like, wasn't quite there. So I was just, yeah. you know, letting him go. And then, one day my husband, like, I think he got his car washed or something and he mm-hmm. took his seat out. And then he realized, like, he looked on the side and he was like, oh, wait, he's this big. Like we can just turn it forward facing, like didn't even tell me. And then I yeah. look in his car and it's forward facing. And I'm like, what, what? Yeah. why didn't you talk to me about this? Yeah. And he was like, well, he's big enough. And I'm like, well, yeah, but I'm it's that for a few, another few months, but it was fine, obviously, yeah, but, for but sure. yeah, yeah. And I feel like that's how it happens. A lot of time is just yeah. it's the convenience of, and he just, you know, he didn't know. Oh, yeah. Um, and we hear a lot from our friends too, like, oh yeah, yeah. You yes. Can, you can turn him around. When Lots of pressure. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we get that a lot. And I will say something I always forget to tell people when I'm talking to them, especially now that we're semi traveling again, yeah. um, what your state law is might differ from where you're going to. So before oh. you go to that state, know what their law is, because if you are coming from a state that is rear facing until one and you travel into a state that is rear facing until two, you have to abide by that state's law. So that's important to know too, because I would hate for families to get <laughs> pulled over on their vacation. And be yeah. Like, what? Yeah. Um, but it's important to know because there are still tons of conflicting laws re- with regards to the state. So um, just know where you're going. So if you know you're going somewhere and you're going to be traveling through that state for a long time, it might be beneficial to you to just turn them back around before you even go. Um, but just keep that in mind for sure. Yeah. Good tip. Yeah. All right. Well, we're kind of at the end of summer. Um, but I did want to talk about some seasonal safety regarding summer tips and getting into, you know, when the colder months start, I know there are some safety things that come up with winter Mm -hmm. tips too. So can you talk about maybe some seasonal stuff? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'll start by saying typically this is going to involve, um, our clothing, and then sometimes it involves some aftermarket items. So just as a, Mm. To start with, got it. Aftermarket items are not recommended from a car seat standpoint if it did not come with your car seat. So that encompasses a lot of stuff. But again, at the end of the day, it it is the parent's choice. But you just need to know um, why 
that is. And it's typically around a car, a crash test uh, standard. Maybe it hasn't been crash tested with that seat. So that manufacturer is not going to put their seal of approval on using it because they haven't been able to crash test it. Yeah. So that goes with seat covers um, and the seat protectors that go under your seat. So if you're using one of those, just check and make sure it's compatible. Um, and then I'll start with summer safety because we're still kind of in that, especially if you're here in the South. Yeah. Um, oh, but yeah. it's important to know um, how fast a car gets hot. So it is um, unbelievably fast. I believe it takes less than four minutes um, for it to get critically hot in a car if your child was ever left in the car Um by themselves. Mm -hmm. And that goes for, even if you have another adult in the car or anything like that, if your car is not running in a very hot day, especially in the eighties, even if you just have the windows cracked, it will still get hot enough for the child to be in danger in the car. Mm -hmm. Um, children's body temperatures rise about three to five times faster than adults. So typically if we're really hot, our child is really hot. Mm -hmm. Um, so we want to keep them nice and cool in the car. Um, we don't want to use any, it's not recommended to use any kind of covers over the seat. So we see that a lot, especially with newborns, because parents want to keep them safe, want to kind of keep germs away from them. Yeah. But if you're in a hot area, using that cover over the infant carrier is not going to allow air to circulate. So you're putting your child at risk for getting overheated in their car seat. So, you know, I tell parents, if you live in a hot climate, if you want to pop that cover, cover over as you're entering the, the doctor's office. And when you leave, that's one thing, yeah. um, but we don't want to keep it on for a long period of time. So if you're going for like a hour stroll through your neighborhood, um, I would not recommend to keep a cover over it just to keep them nice and cool. Um, the car seats themselves are not breathable as we all know. I mean, I think I just took Very my, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And like I said, I'm in South Carolina too. So I know, you know, you're above me, yeah. but I, I had my car, I had the AC like blasting on my mm -hmm. way home just now. And my son, when I took him out of the car seat, he was still sweating. I mean, yeah. he was like full of sweat when I took yeah. him out. So, um, that's the biggest thing when it comes to heat strokes, we want to make sure that we're always, um, making sure that our child's out of the car seat. And that again is super important for caregivers. A lot of people don't think that that could happen to him, them, but it is non, it doesn't discriminate. It can truly happen to anybody, especially with changes of routines. Yeah. If you're a new parent, um, we, you're just not used to having that child back there. So what we recommend um, is to put a reminder in the back seat. So I recommend putting your purse, keys, something that you absolutely have to have to get out of the car. And that's going to remind you to turn around and look behind you before you get out. Um, and then obviously if you ever come across a child who is in the car by themselves, we want everybody to call 911 immediately, yeah. um, before assisting that child, but always call, don't ever second guess it. Even if the climate is in the seventies, um, we typically still see heat stroke deaths. Um, mm -hmm. I think this year, the lowest recorded temperature for a heat stroke death was 68. Wow. So I think a lot of people would not think that that would be a concerning temp. Um, but again, it only takes 10 to 15 minutes for, I think a 20 degree increase in the car. So it doesn't take much. Um, and then briefly going into the winter weather, kind of the same concept with, uh, big puffy jackets. We don't want to put anything bulky, um, on the child in their car seat. We want that harness to be as close to their body as possible. So I think the same goes for us adults. You know, we shouldn't really be wearing these big puffy jackets as we're driving because yeah. the same concept, however thick that jacket is, that's how much space is created between the harness and their body. Um, so I always recommend, especially if it's really cold outside, um, we want to still to put them in their car seat in just their normal clothes to keep that harness real nice and snug. And then maybe place the blanket or the jacket over the top of them. Mm -hmm. um, but you want to pass what's called the pinch test. So the harness should be tight enough to their body that you can't pinch any additional webbing above the retainer clip. Um, there is an option to put them in with themselves, like without the jacket, get it nice and snug, take them out, put the jacket on, 
then put the child back in to that that's, same tightness, but it's too like, much work. Yeah. That's too much. To stick. Too much work. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if you're going to do it, that is what's recommended. So Got I it. just, for us here, I keep a winter blanket in the car when it's cold. I keep that yeah. specifically for the car seat. And so I know that it's cold outside, but I'm only going to be putting him in very briefly before I warm him up. So I've had to say that yeah. to my mom so yeah. many times, like, she's like, put on a coat. And I'm like, it's, it's literally five steps. Go. Yeah. And like he does it. I have it in my hands. I will put it over him. Like when yeah. I get in the car, same thing, like running into the grocery store. Mm-hmm. It's like, you're not, it's not that far. Yeah, like, it's I so promise. Close. I yeah. promise. Yeah. yeah. And I always do the same thing that I use in the summer. So yeah. they heat up five times, three to five times faster yeah. than us. So even in the winter, if I have him in a nice sweater or a, or a, you know, pair of pants, he's going to be fine. You know, yeah. I've, so I, that's what I always recommend too. It's real brief. Um, it'll be real fast. And then typically I feel like they like having that blanket over them anyways. I know my son does. Um, he would probably lose his mind if I try to put him in the car seat with a big puffy jacket. Um, but I just, you know, give yourself a winter blanket to keep in the car. Um, but the biggest thing is the harness tightness is the biggest thing that I can stress in regards to car seat safety. You really want that harness nice and snug around their hips and on their shoulders. So anything that's going to prevent that, I wouldn't recommend. Um, Same with the car seat inserts. We want to be real careful with those, especially the ones that have the big head position or pillows, Mm. um, because that in itself can present a safe sleep issue if they turn into those big pillows Mm -hmm. um, before they have their head and neck strength. So any aftermarket item, the um, harness covers, anything like that, just check with your manufacturer before um, you use them just so that you know what risk might be associated with them. Yeah. A tip. All right. Well, let's finish up with some resources. Do you have any resources that you can recommend maybe free resources or people can find out like more information about car seat safety? Yeah, for sure. So the big one is NHTSA, which I know sounds great. Like who's going to go to a government website, but NHTSA has so many great videos. Um, they're a great resource. Um, if you're not familiar with safe kids worldwide, they are, um, they are the ones who kind of host the CPST certification. So if you have been through this training or you've worked with the tech, they know about safe kids. They have gotten the, um, a lot of the literature from safe kids. So safe Kids Worldwide is a great resource. Um, National Transportation Board is a great resource. And then the biggest resource is your manufacturer's uh, website. It's going to tell you everything that you need to know. It's going to tell you if you've been in an accident, if it needs to be replaced or not. Um, And the biggest thing I can say too about manufacturers, a lot of times when someone hears, oh, call their customer service, they're like, oh, I don't want to call customer service, <laughs> but when it, it comes miserable, to, yeah. <laughs> but when it comes to car seat manufacturers, for the majority of them, um, they are having all of their staff trained as car seat techs. So you're not going to call like Britax, for instance, and you're not going to get just somebody that's specifically customer service, it's going to be a car seat technician. So when you ask them questions, they are going to be able to legitimately answer those questions, not only from a manufacturing standpoint, but from a car seat tech standpoint. So it's super useful. Like I, I love them. And even for me as a tech, if I come across a weird situation where I'm having trouble with a specific seat, I call the manufacturer's customer service um, when I'm working with that family. So that's a huge resource. There are some amazing techs out there that have started some amazing blogs. Um, So there's tons of different blogs out there of car seat technicians. And the only thing that I say, and I'm obviously I'm not somebody that has a blog or anything like that. I'm just a little old tech, Um, (laughs) but you know, when I, from a parent standpoint, there's going to be lots of recommendations. So if you come across a site that is recommending specific seats or specific things, take that with a grain of salt, because okay. that again is their opinion as yeah. that specific tech. So what I might recommend for a family, another tech of mine may recommend a totally different seat. That's why we try to stay away from recommending specific seats. They all have different things, but it's really going to be about what works for you and your family 
and what seat you might buy may not work for me. So, um, you know, take their information and their expertise, um, to heart. They went through the training and they know what they're talking about. Um, but just be careful whenever we're getting, you know, specific recommendations. Cause as a parent, it's really hard to not feel like you need to do something like that. I know for me as a mom, when I saw everybody in the same stroller, I was like, Oh, I need that stroller. Every mom (laughs) that I'm passing has the stroller. Um, but you know, just pick something that works best for your family. They're not going to lead you astray. Um, and then if you go to the NHTSA website, um, you can type in your address and it's going to pop up any tech that's in your area. And so oh, you can cool. call them. Um, you can find out where your nearest inspection station is, what their appointment times are, um, and then reach out to them. And don't be afraid to ask and to make sure that they're still certified. I know that sounds crazy too, but um, what I told a family recently was, you know, if I told you like, hey, I'm a phlebotomist, I'm going to <laughs> come draw your blood but I haven't been certified for seven years, but Hey, I was a phlebotomist for 12 years. Right. Like you're not going to want me to draw your blood, you know, same with techs. (laughs) So you want to make sure the tech is still certified, still up to date, no matter what their background was. So don't be afraid to ask to see their wallet card. We all have wallet cards that prove that we're still certified. Um, So again, that's just me as an instructor talking, but just make sure (laughs) that you're using somebody that's still certified too. Cool. Well, this was fabulous. Thank you, Bridget, for joining me. This was so great. I think a lot of people are going to get some really good information from this episode, expecting moms and, you know, new moms or moms of toddlers or moms of any kids who need a car seat. So thank you for for joining me. No problem. Thanks for having me. All right, guys, that wraps up this week's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in and letting me be a part of your motherhood journey. It is truly an honor. If you like what you heard, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And I love hearing what you guys think of the podcast. So if you're liking what you hear or you have a suggestion, I'd be so grateful if you'd go ahead and leave me a review wherever you're listening to help more mamas just like you find the show. What do you think? Are you starting to feel a little more confident about your pregnancy and birth? Well, if you want more, be sure to head on over to mommylabornurse.com slash podcast for today's show notes and a library of episodes so you can keep getting educated before your upcoming birth. And while you're over there, be sure to check out the blog and learn about our online birth classes. Find it all and more over at mommylabornurse.com slash podcast. See you next week. Same time, same place.